ago, a man boarded a train in New Haven, Connecticut, heading north. The final destination of that locomotive was Boston. In between, there were various stops along the way. The last stop of this young student athlete? Well, only he really knew for sure. Why did Sly get off the train in Kingston instead of Providence College, as was thought to be his final stop? What happened in between those stops has become that of folklore, myth, and urban legend. Tonight, you may find the real story. We'll take a look back at the journey that led to a colorful career and explore the controversy behind the legend of how Sly Williams became a Rhode Island Ram. was undoubtedly one of the best players ever to put on a Rams uniform. Well, he was, he was big, he was 6'7", he was left-handed, which was a, you know, he was a great athlete. My theory is that all great players are a generation ahead of themselves. Uh, there are a lot of Sly Williamses out there today, you know, big guys who can handle the ball. Uh, he was unique for his era. His journey began on the playgrounds and backyards of New Haven, Connecticut. I know this is the old neighborhood and this is where you grew up, but you had a large family. Tell me what life was like uh, growing up in this house and in this neighborhood. Well, the neighborhood, first of all, was a beautiful neighborhood 40 years ago. It was wonderful. You know, I, I grew up in this house right here, a three family. Uh, on the second floor, I remember a lot of great times uh -huh. with a big family of, of 12 brothers and sisters. And uh, we just enjoyed ourselves. It was kind of tight, you know, as you know, a lot of no room there. But it was it was uh, fabulous, you know. Uh, I, you know, my mother, by her being a single parent, you know, uh, she raised us and did the best that she could. And uh, it, it was just wonderful time growing up here, no yeah. problem. Now, playing, playing basketball in the inner city <laughs> these days is very different than it was when we were playing, yes. okay? Because the playground and the recreation center, that was it. That's where you kind of got started to get your rep where a lot of kids are playing AAU basketball now. But when did you first start to get the sense of the feeling that you were pretty good at this basketball thing? And when did other people start to notice that? Because I know it probably started to have it right in this playground. Yes, it did. Um, I started to actually develop and started, my skills are starting to hone in. I was just constantly out here when nobody was out here dribbling the ball, shooting the ball, just being at the park all day, as, I, as you can see at the recreation center and also here at the park. Now at this park, it was always, it's not a basketball court here now, right. but it was a nice big basketball court running along this way right here. Yeah. And I would come out here every day in the summer, even uh, in the winter, when we would come out here and shovel and be out here shooting baskets, <laughs> and hands freezing, everything is freezing. <laughs> We're waiting for the rec center to open up. But you know, the guys that I grew up with, we, this is what we did. There was uh, a, a, a guy, he was, uh, his name is uh, Dave Newton. Okay. He was trying, uh, he, he went to college and he, he went to camp with the Boston Celtics. But then he started playing basketball with my brother. Then as, is that as, Dave? Yeah, okay. he started playing with Dave. And Dave was having the tryouts with his team, that team, the slide would play him, play him every day they played. I would play against him all the time when he come, when he come back from the camp you know, he got cut a couple of times and he comes back and I would play against him. And I started to notice that I was starting to get good. So then when he started beating Dave, <laughs> then it became apparent that he was going to be a basketball player. You know, right. I started to notice that even if they hit me, I wouldn't 
cry. I wouldn't do this. Um, I can dribble the ball. I can run around them. And it, I started getting more confidence in myself and knowing that I could play with the older guys because I really never played with somebody my age at that time. I always right. played against older people. And I think that helped me out a lot because, you know, as I'm playing, I'm learning from them. And, and that was the biggest thing is it was fun, but it was also a learning experience right, that yeah. I always kept the knowledge of what was going on. So it, it was like a camp. Alex Howard back and forth with Smith. A minute 34. Sly Williams shoots and hits. That's a pretty shot to watch. Sly Williams goes to. That's a goal pending violation if you hit any part of the basket right. of the rim more than that. I didn't see it either. Sly Williams bats it away and out of bounds. Five seconds. Look for him. Looking for Williams. Yes! Yes! When he went to the league, I didn't know who Sly was, because we call him Sylvester. Right. So they kept, a friend of mine named Jim Brown, he said, you got to come see Sly play. I said, who's Sly? <laughs> he said, he played for the league. I said, I don't know nobody named Sly. So I went down there, and, and it was him. That's when I first got, started calling him Sly. I never knew that name until he started playing for the league. He came in as a freshman, and I was a young kid myself. I was in my late 20s, and I'm coaching this inner city team and uh, his name was Sylvester Williams and uh, he was only a ninth grader and I think he barely made the varsity, you know, and uh, as, you know, in coach speak, uh, I said, geez, I'm not going to start yelling his name Sylvester all over the place and I started calling him Sly because it was you know, from the 70s and 60s with uh, <laughs> Sly and the Family Stone. So all of a sudden, this name that <laughs> I started calling him Sly, I'm, years later, I'm getting phone calls from all over the country about college coaches saying, you know, we want to talk to Sly or we want to recruit Sly and everything. But to get, to get back, um, as a freshman, he was about 5'10", five, 5'11". Five, right. And all of a sudden, his sophomore year, he came back and, and, you know, they had played in the summer league and everything. And he got to, he was 6'4". And right. we had quite a team. We got beat in the semifinals of the state that year. And he was a real natural. He had a great instinct and uh, basketball IQ, as the saying goes. He passed the ball, he, he was a leader on the court. We used to press a lot, and he was the kind of player that he knew every position on the court. You see him directing the traffic and setting up his players and telling them what to do. And he connects. The best way, the best way to get the uh, mid-match break is to get on the offensive board just like he was that last stretch there. Sly Williams takes his first shot of the afternoon and connects. He's been alert all afternoon. Sly Williams goes through. 71-67. As if he moves uh, Sly Williams down the outside. Yes, he is. Putting him inside. There's that turnaround jumper. Sly Williams now has 18 points in the game. Ken Woodson brings it across for Lee. Sly Williams down there low. Fall away jumper, it is good. Ten points for Sly Williams of Lee. The pass was made, so there is no player control. And through the first slip, and now that second man up there will be the coach, Pete Evans. What a happy young man he must be. His fifth year as the head coach. And then his senior year, he just... He had already made a, a national reputation. His senior year, he was just fabulous. And the great thing about him as a player was if you played an average team, so to speak, and we had a very difficult schedule, he would be content to pass to everyone and make everyone around him look great. Um, if we played Hartford Weaver with Ricky Mahorn, who, you know, Detroit Pistons, and we played them three times his senior year, when we played against him, he would get 30 or 35. 
Uh, we play, we split with them, and then in the state championship, uh, we beat them in overtime at the New Haven Coliseum. And uh, he just was a great all-around player. Um, passed the ball exceptionally well. We used to go for a corner, and people would criticize me um, and say, Geez, why do you have a six foot seven kid playing the middle on the four corner? I said, because he's the best passer and the best basketball skills that we have. And he would just dominate the game in every way. Benny Woodson lets go, hits the back of the rim, Cy Williams goes up, race comes down, goes up the middle down, and he is fouled. If you knew what you knew now, you were watching the future, but at the time you didn't know it was the future. Lem sidesteps, goes in the corner, feeds it out the slide, 25 feet out, he drives, he's getting in, he puts it up underhand, and in, off the backboard, beautiful move, Cy Williams. In the early 70s or mid 70s, Somebody 6'7 was usually a, a forward or even a center back in those days. But Sly Williams was probably the first player that I ever saw at 6'7 that could play either the point guard the position, the shooting guard position, the small forward, or the strong forward. You know, he had some great, great athletic ability. Bruce Campbell was a little bit like that. Sly's ability to handle the ball, um, make perimeter shots, uh, it, like it made him special back then. 6'5 and 6'6 six, six back in the 70s was big. I mean, now you have guards playing who are 6'5 and 6'6. Six, six. He was physically imposing. He was a wonderful passer, and he was an unselfish, unselfish player who made people around him better. And I, I don't think I can uh, pay anyone a higher compliment than that. He was kind of that, uh, that all-around athlete. You know, he wasn't really a big man, uh, like back-to-the-basket kind of big man. But he also wasn't a true guard either. He was a classic swing man who uh, uh, could uh, drill, penetrate, could step out and shoot. Sly was, uh, had the ability to take the ball inside. He could take it outside. He had a per perimeter shooting touch. Was uh, was absolutely beautiful for, you know, I, I, they listed him as 6'8". I mean, he, as far as I'm concerned, he could have been 6'7 or 6'9", but he, he was as big as he wanted to be. And you know, you, you look at him when you want to quantify the talent that Sly had individually. He was a second team All-America pick. And on the first team, was Larry Bird. Uh, Magic Johnson. Mike Jaminski. Uh, David Greenwood. Uh, I think Sidney Moncrief was around that time too. That's, that's the top five. Uh, you know, NBA Hall of Famers. All those guys were elite, elite players, and Sly was right behind them. Great shooting here in the second half. Stanley Wright will cut her. Sly, he lays it up and in. Beautiful play by the Rams. I know that uh, playing in the playgrounds helped you to develop your game. You talked about Dave Newton and the fact that he was a nice benchmark when you knew you were getting really good. Let's talk about when the colleges knew that you were getting good and the recruitment process. Talk a little bit about what your recruitment process was like, the schools that you, that you heard from, and obviously to the, the decision point about where you ultimately were going to go. But what, what kind of schools were interested in you? What was that recruitment process like for you? Okay, I can remember my first getting my first letter from uh, the University of Connecticut, and then three more came after. I didn't even know the name of the schools. I didn't even know that they were even looking, and they sent me letters, and I was like, "Oh, somebody wants me," you know. Somebody <laughs> thinks I'm, I'm pretty good, and um, at the time, I didn't think I was good. I was only a, a sophomore, you know, um, and so. I, you know, I started 
to think more of myself. I started to prepare myself more, but the, the process had just begun and I didn't, I didn't know what to expect because it was new for me. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of trips did you take? What was the recruiting process like for you? What did you learn uh, throughout that entire process? Well, I, I learned that, uh, it, you know, it's, it's nice to go visit places and, and uh, meet new people and uh, understand that um, it was, you know, it was a business. Recruiting was different then. You didn't have, it wasn't as, like in the forefront. The word was he was a great player. Uh, like in New Haven, I knew Providence was involved with him. I knew Uri was involved with him. Well, I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't intimately involved in recruiting. I just knew all about Sly because Bruce Campbell, who was from New Haven, was on our team. And Bruce had told us just how good a player Sly was. And, and David told me um, the kind of potential he had as a player. So in that particular recruiting year, he was the, he was the number one recruit for us. And obviously Rhode Island was, was heavily involved, as were many, many other schools. He was that good of a player. Well, I think everybody in, in, uh, in the East Coast, and, and if not nationally, knew of uh, Sly's uh, ability as a, uh, as a player. Um, he was, uh, and, and so that was an ongoing uh, uh, discussion uh, and, and uh, who would be involved with, uh, with, with him and, and whatnot. He was uh, uh, easily one of, the, one of the top recruits in the country. Did you have anybody that was actually helping you through that process, who may have mentored you or gave you any advice, or were you pretty much out there on your own? I was pretty much out there on my own. You know, my mother was working. Uh, you know, my brothers, older brothers uh, and siblings, you know, they had their thing that they were doing. So basically, you know, I was uh, answering phone calls, answering letters, and when they come in to visit, I would talk to them and make plans to go on out there. So I basically did this uh, on the fly, you know. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was exciting, it was a new experience, so, it, and, a, and another challenge in my life. Okay, what did some of your visits entail? Where did you actually, what campuses did you actually visit? Okay, I, I went, uh, the first one I went to was University of Minnesota, you mm -hmm. know, big campus, uh, a lot of places, uh, University of Louisville, uh, of course, uh, URI, um, Connecticut. I went out to Michigan. I went down to Georgia. It was uh, in a, a few others, Tennessee. Um, and I, I wasn't really, didn't want to go out west, so I went to Texas, you know, University of Texas. I know you made a lot of visits, and then you made the big decision, or maybe two big decisions. <laughs> <laughs> you made a decision uh, to attend Providence College, but you had also uh, visited uh, University of Rhode Island. Talk about the, the, the final decision. You made a decision to go to PC, then you decided to go to Rhode Island. What was the thing that attracted you to Providence, and why did you ultimately decide that you wanted to attend the University of Rhode Island? Well, the main thing that attracted me to Providence uh, was because they had a really good basketball program. Uh, they were, uh, I don't know, uh, number four or five in preseason uh, honors uh, to, you know, to win, yeah. you know, uh, national. Final four in uh, 73. <laughs> right. Yep. So, you know, that intrigued me a lot, and uh, you know, I went up there and visit, and uh, you know, it was just a, a really good program. I thought that would uh, help me out, right. you know. So I, I really was uh, wanting to go there. Top of the foul circle, feeding off right to Soup Campbell. Campbell looking out, feeding Massage, just top of the key at the point guard spot. Works it over left now. Joey Hassett puts up a 25-footer. It is good. Providence in that period of time was coming off the Final Four in 1973, had a big-time team. Uh, Joe Hassett was on the team. 
uh, Bruce Campbell, Bob Misavishis, Bill Eason all came in in the same recruiting class, one of the best recruiting classes Providence has ever had. To add someone like Sly to that group, then they're a true top 10. They were already always in the top 25 in that era, but now they're going to be top 10 and make a run at, at a national type finish. Only one man knows for sure exactly what happened that summer day back in 1976. It may be forever up to the historians and rumor mongers to fill in the blanks. Here's the rumor, whether, you know, fact, fiction, somewhere in the middle. He's on his way to Providence College, and somehow he ends up, in, like in Kingston. Maybe he was on a train, maybe he was in someone's car, maybe he flew, maybe he was in a helicopter, maybe he was on a you know, horseback, who knows? But the rumor was he was on his way to, to PC, and he ends up at URI. You know, I don't, I don't know the whole story because we, from our perspective, a Sly committed to come to Providence and uh, we were expecting him. And then on the day he was to arrive, he appeared on the URI campus and made an announcement that he was going to attend URI. I, I, I think the Sly story is captivating because no one really knows what, what, what happened. He was supposed to go to Providence, Dave Gavitt had him at Providence, and then it gets murky. He was on a train from New Haven. To Providence, it stopped in Kingston. He was captured off the train. Well, yeah, that's the one that that, that I've heard. Just that uh, you know, he was going from uh, New Haven, coming down to uh, to Providence, or coming up to Providence, and he was on the Amtrak train, and uh, it stopped. It was the the milk run where it stopped at every station, including Kingston, and there were some guys at Kingston that uh, coaxed him to get off the train at that point, and uh, you know, come up 138 to to the University of Rhode Island. That's the, the folklore that usually is told when I'm in the conversations, but uh, you know, who really knows? The funny part of it is I have no version to it. You know, I had heard initially that, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, took the train up here, and then I heard that he was in a car, then I heard he was in a bus, and over the years, you know, they get bigger and bigger, the rumors do. Well, from what I heard, uh, Sly was on his way up to Providence College by train, and for some reason, I don't know if the train was supposed to stop in Kingston or stop in Providence, but he stopped off in, in Kingston, and I think the rest is history. All I know is that Rhode Island coaching staff people changed Sly's mind at some point. He was definitely committed to go to Providence. His high school coach thought he was going to Providence, and yet when school opened in September, he was in Kingston. And uh, how it all happened is the mystery of Sly Williams. Well, you know, we talked about some of the factors that went into your decision. When did you actually make it? When did people say, you know, that you, you got to PC and you turned around and went to URI? So how did that actually happen? So like, when did you actually make that decision? And what went down that day that you actually showed up at URI? Well, actually, I made the decision about two to three weeks before I was supposed to show up on, uh, and uh, sign up for uh, classes at uh, PC. Uh, I had uh, didn't talk to anyone about it. I just kept going over it in my mind and in my mind is because I didn't want no outside distractions about, you know, where well, you made this decision, you have to live with it. I knew that I had made a, a real bad mistake, meaning that I, I wanted to go to PC, but my heart was at the University of Rhode Island. Right. And so, Two weeks before that, I had decided that I was going to the University of Rhode Island uh, no matter what, and, um, and that's what I did. Okay, so the day you were supposed to show up to register, yes, you went to Kingston versus staying going on 95 and going to Providence. Yes, I did. Uh, you know, I, when, I, when I left here, I knew exactly where I was going. I was okay. going to the University of Rhode Island to, you know, what. Uh, it wasn't that I got off on the on the wrong stop or anything. <laughs> it's uh, you know, I I just wanted to be happy and, and and make the right decision for me, and 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 that's what I did. And uh, I I think everything you know kind of worked out. Maybe not so much as for Providence, but I know definitely for the University of Rhode Island and myself. As one can imagine, the news of Sly's sudden change of heart 
spread quickly throughout the ocean state. One sunny morning, and I remember this specifically, I was sitting in my office and the sunlight was streaming in the window. Phone rings. I answered the phone and a voice on the other end without identifying himself said, how are you, Jim? Well, I knew exactly who it was. It was Bill Perillo, the late Bill Perillo from the Providence Journal. He was the columnist in those days. Now remember, this is back in 1976, during the summer. And uh, he says, what's new? And I said, what do you mean, what's new? What are you talking about? He said, you don't know, do you? I said, no, I don't know. What am I supposed to know? He says, Sly Williams just signed a letter of intent with you folks to play for URI. I said, you have got to be kidding me. And I remember sitting in a bar the first time I was in Pawtucket, and I wasn't a sports writer at that, and that was breaking news. It was like five or six o'clock in the afternoon, and Sly Williams is at URI. It was a huge story at the time. Dave Gavitt had a tremendous reputation as a recruiter, but for Sly, going to PC presented a few problems. Dave said all the right things, it's just that uh, at the end he told me they had really a great team and that I wouldn't be able to start, but I would play a lot. And that factor factored in of me probably going to Rhode Island uh, even more because I wanted to play right away. The interesting thing is that uh, when, when Sly made the decision to go to Rhode Island, uh, Dave's attitude is we just weren't going to talk about it anymore. There's, there was no sense talking about it. He was there, and we were going to have to play against them, and, and he was a really, really good player. It was the beginning of the animosity between PC and like, URI. That's Sly Williams' legacy. Uh, yes, was it a rivalry? Yes. Was it a heated rivalry? No. Um, they would play twice a year, and sometimes URI would win. If they did, it was kind of an upset, but it wasn't this passion play. The Sly Williams, that day, started the passion play. It changed that rivalry forever. to let everyone out there know that uh, Providence College is a good school. Uh, they had a, uh, a good basketball team and it wasn't nothing personal. It was just something that you know, I felt that I wanted to do and if I offended anyone, I apologize.